Between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the revolutions of 1848, there was a period of relative stability and peace in Austria. The middle classes prospered and enjoyed elegant, well-ordered lives, and their art reflected these qualities. It depicted with meticulous realism a world of coach rides in the country, of families, children at play, well-kept gardens, and idyllic countryside. This art and the culture it celebrates came to be known in later years by the affectionate name Biedermeier. The name is from an obscure fictional character, a schoolmaster, who in retrospect came to embody those middle-class precepts of conformity and respectability which were characteristic of the Biedermeier years. In the German language, Bieder means honest and virtuous, but also narrow-minded, while Mayer is a German surname. Together, they can be translated as Upright Smith or Virtuous Jones. Biedermeier paintings depicted idyllic scenes, but the good old days, which were seen as typical of the Biedermeier era, were not all they appeared. They only give that warm, spirited appearance because the people who created them wished them so. Most of the people had no illusions, but lived a life of poverty under a political system identified with State Chancellor Metternich and his repressive methods. To escape the police state mentality, people turned to a new lifestyle focused on privacy. At the beginning of the 19th century, Napoleon brought fear and terror to Europe. Napoleon came to power immediately after the French Revolution. He was, like all revolutionaries of those days, of the class of the citizen. But he betrayed the cause of this class and set out to conquer the world. In 1809, he suffered his first decisive defeat. When his campaign against Tsarist Russia was turned into a fiasco by the Russian winter, it was possible for the other European powers for the first time to regain the upper hand. At the Battle of Waterloo, which he fought on returning from his first period of exile, he encountered final defeat. After almost a quarter of a century of Napoleonic Wars, the Emperor Napoleon was first stopped by Austrian Archduke Karl at the Battle of Aspern in 1809, as depicted in this painting. It was the beginning of the end for Napoleon. Just five years later, after this battle, he'd find himself in exile on the island of Elba. And to remake the map of Europe, after the fall of Napoleon, the Congress of Vienna was convened here by Austria's leading diplomat, Count Metternich. Although it was referred to by critics who said the Congress danced, it did more than that. It set the political tone and mood of the world for an era. The Congress dances soon became a household word because the round of entertainment seemed endless. But there was enough time left over for serious political discussions aimed at realigning Europe in a manner which pleased the old conservative powers of the time. Under the skilled guidance of Prince Metternich, the three leading monarchs at the Congress of Vienna, Emperor Franz of Austria, Tsar Alexander of Russia, and King Frederick Wilhelm of Prussia ensured that pre-revolutionary conditions were restored in Europe. It left Austrians with very few freedoms, mainly those which appeared harmless, such as letting off steam by dancing.
In those days, Josef Lanner, together with the elder Johann Strauss, dominated the Vienna light music scene. Between them, they perfected the Viennese waltz. And they kept the Viennese in suspense with their competition. Lanner and Strauss played at village balls and in concert halls. They were as popular as top pop singers are today. It was the elder Strauss who, for the first time, saw to it that at dances, money did not have to be collected for musicians by passing a hat, but that entrance fees were charged. He raised dancing to the level of cultural events. These balls and festivities in elegant surroundings came to be seen as typical Viennese entertainment, to which the ruling class had no objection, since light-hearted entertainment took the mind off other worries. The Biedermeier period was also characterized by a number of technical novelties. In 1837, the first steam railway was built in Austria, Emperor Franz, who did not want to see his strict order upset, had prevented the introduction of the railway. Only after he died was it possible for the railway age to unfold in the Danube monarchy. The new means of transport, steamship and railway, soon became indispensable, first for industry, but very soon for passengers. miserable existence. The new industry had thrown many craftsmen out of work, and those who did find employment were badly paid. Around 1830, the Industrial Revolution began to have a widespread effect in Austria. Machine production increased the number of goods available and made the economy prosper, although the proceeds were not distributed fairly. The gap between the living standards of the upper and middle class and the workforce increased. In the factories, the working day often stretched to 16 hours. Children were employed because they could be paid even less than adults. Not all inventions and improvements were given the recognition they deserved at the time. For instance, the master tailor Josef Mattersberger developed a sewing machine suitable for mass production, but he died unknown and impoverished. And the ship's propeller, invented by Josef Ressel, only had one successful trial run in Trieste Harbor before its rejection. 
a new greatly improved camera lens designed by Peter Voitlander and Josef Petzval did not go into production in Austria because of a quarrel between the two inventors. In the household field, the new technology made little impact, with the exception of gas lighting. At home, one went on using normal, handmade articles, but if one could afford it, with the artistically crafted items, which became so typical of the Biedermeyer age. There were enterprises turning out inexpensive domestic ware, but the nobility and wealthy families prided themselves on their artistic taste and commissioned furniture from skilled craftsmen. The most typical Biedermeyer furniture is essentially middle class in style, functional, cool, and simple. Even imaginative designs never became ostentatious or overloaded with decoration. Tableware and glasses were particularly artistic. A separate branch of decoration grew up, transparent painting on drinking glasses. Anton Kotzgasser turned them into a Viennese specialty. Landscapes, flowers, animals, portraits, and views of Vienna were reduced to a world of miniature. Gottlob Mohn was another leading exponent of this artistic skill, whose exquisite achievements soon acquired fame far beyond the frontiers of Vienna, and are to this day highly valued by art dealers and collectors. In Vienna, porcelain manufacturing also flourished as never before. Fashion also became simpler and free of earlier pretensions. This trend among the citizenry was reflected in the nobility and at court. Even Emperor Franz affected middle-class habits. Viennese fashion designers were, for the first time, able to resist the competition from Western Europe. Eyes were no longer turned exclusively to Paris and London. The Viennese found their own style. In contrast to the desire to lock themselves into their homes in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, the musical development of these times was outgoing and forward. The avant-garde attitude of the composers was in stark contrast to the prevailing sentiment of the times, which was, my home is my castle. And in this atmosphere, the musicians thrived. In 1815, Schubert composed the Heider Roseline to a poem by Goethe. In 1818, Beethoven wrote the Missa Solemnis. Classical genius thrived with giants like Richard Wagner, Brahms, Liszt, Mendelssohn, Schumann, Handel, and Weber. In 1840, Paganini died, Tchaikovsky was born, and in Vienna, Johann Strauss was the waltz king, the pop star of his times. But in Biedermeyer, Vienna, there also lived people who did not fit into this simple framework. For example, Ludwig van Beethoven. 
His music, his hymns, symphonies, and wild string quartets somehow contradicted the Bedermeyer spirit. He was an outsider who sometimes reacted rudely to his fellow men. But his works were played, and he led a successful life although he never achieved the popular acclaim enjoyed by the light music figures. He was popular because in Biedermeyer, Vienna, if legends grow up around a person, they're bound to enjoy a degree of popularity. One of these legends says that the bells of Heligenstadt Church were the last sounds Beethoven ever heard because as old age approached, he became totally deaf. It was quite a different matter with Franz Schubert, who died young. He fitted into the Biedermeyer cliché. Most of his musical works were written for a circle of friends and for domestic evenings around the piano. However, from time to time, his compositions were regarded as too difficult. The new form that they represented impeded their distribution. Vienna in those days was not only a city of music, but also a lively theater city with a rich tradition. In addition to the Imperial Court Theater, there were numerous smaller houses in the suburbs, such as the Karl Theater and Theatre an der Wien. New works were constantly being performed. Only one thing could prevent this, the censorship. Writers and authors were constantly struggling against Metternich's censorship. One who was able to successfully thwart Metternich's censorship was Johann Nestroy a great satirist, a theatrical genius, whose plays are still performed today. At that time, theater was closely linked to current events. Nestroy made constant references in his plays to contemporary affairs, whose relevance has not been forgotten. Difficulties with the police were not unusual for this sharp-tongued parodist. In his work about the revolutionary year 1848, he made fun of the Biedermeyer situation. Nestroy's great rival on the stage was Ferdinand Raimund. He was also a comedian, but with a touch of melancholy. His contemporary references were disguised in fairy tale surroundings. He was not as aggressive as Nestroy, but his audience understood him because his figures were clearly identifiable. His works reflected the age. They depict instant careers in which some could make a fortune overnight but also risk losing everything and becoming a beggar. In the 18th century, Vienna had been completely rebuilt and became a Baroque city. During the Biedermeyer era, there were further alterations which had quite a different effect. More and more apartment houses were built, providing a lucrative source of income because of the shortage of accommodation in the cramped walled city of Vienna. The new buildings, such as the Technical University, were erected outside the city walls because plenty of building space was available there. And it was there that Paul Sprenger erected the Mint office. 
He was an architect who, for many years as court building supervisor, set standards for official buildings in Vienna. With monumental structures by Peter Nobel, neoclassicism was still in evidence as part of an enthusiasm for antiquity, which was also reflected in the same architect's imitation Greek thesis building. Classical antiquity continued to exercise a considerable influence. For instance, in the baths at the spa town of Baden by Vein, or for the commemorative Hussars Temple by Josef Kornazel on the Anninger Mountain. Kornhäusel built for the aristocracy. He came to be regarded as the Vienna Biedermeier architect. Domestic architecture for the middle classes was consistently simple and modest. Even families with plenty of money did not display their wealth, but preferred instead to comply with the middle class mood of Biedermeier. In painting, it gradually became the custom to copy nature, to see the world as it was, and to depict it in that way. The Biedermeier landscape painting was a way to include the illusion of quiet life in the country into the narrow privacy of an average Biedermeier family. Biedermeier landscape painting does not lack atmosphere or feeling, but the details are often copied from nature with infinite precision. Ferdinand Waldmüller was the most important painter of this period, and he set new standards for Austria. In portrait painting, he sought realism. A person was no longer depicted as he would be in a court portrait, but with subtly observed psychological characteristics. These characteristics applied equally to the family portrait. Waldmüller, in his pictures, predicted much of the style that would be important in the late 19th century painters. With some painters, such as Frederick Amerling, late Baroque influences are still clearly apparent, partly in the gestures and the behavior of the person shown. Even in situations where human meanness and hatred are depicted, such as with the reading of the will by Josef Danauser, the satirical intention is modified by comedy. Ammerling showed everyday life as it really was, but with a lyrical delicacy and poetic radiance. The same applies to Peter Fendi, whose paintings get to the very heart of the being, but somehow make it more attractive by softening the edges of the situation. A naive outsider on the Vienna Biedermeier scene 
was Mikhail Nader, referred to because of his original trade as Cobbler Nader. He was a painter of cryptic peculiarity. The Industrial Revolution went forward, but the economic problems of the masses led to unrest in several levels of society. After another revolution in Paris in February 1848, there was an uprising in Vienna, which altered the political situation instantaneously. When arms were handed out from the civic armory, a new power situation arose. The people, citizens and students, workers and peasants seized the initiative. The immediate result was that a constitution was promised and press freedom, or at least lifting of censorship, was initiated. State Chancellor Metternich, the symbol of the repressive state, resigned and fled Austria. For more than three decades, he had directed Austria's destiny with ever stricter measures. The collapse of the old order in Austria could be postponed but not halted. The crunch came in 1848. The revolution laid the groundwork for a fundamental change in life and the individual freedoms in Austria and it marked the end of the Biedermeier age.